I will surely get in a lot of trouble for saying this, but faith is a huge element of this market and faith is working right now. Faith is making billions of dollars for people. You know what I mean? Hi, I'm Taylor Owen and this is Big Tech. Like I was saying, it's FTX. It's a safe and easy way to get into crypto. Yeah, I don't think so. And I'm never wrong about this stuff. Never. With crypto commercials dominating the Super Bowl this year, and billionaire VCs like Peter Thiel championing digital assets, and celebrity endorsements left, right, and center, including from tennis legend Serena Williams, who attended last week's Miami Bitcoin conference. I'm really into the the whole cryptocurrency because I think it's obviously the future. I think it's fair to say that digital assets are no longer a fringe movement. An economy that became popular because of the absence of centralized or an organizing body, and whose early days many claimed would democratize the financial world and even overturn nation states, is now turning heads beyond the early adopters. Efrat Livni has witnessed this progression. She reports on business and policy for DealBook at the New York Times. She's seen the move of crypto from periphery to center. And now the latest to take notice are governments around the world. Just recently, the EU passed several rules around crypto, and the US announced their intent to develop regulations in this space. But is crypto still crypto once Big Brother steps in? And is this oversight in the name of protecting the user, or big banks, or the viability and interests of states themselves? Here's my conversation with Efrat Livni. I think the technology of cryptocurrencies and crypto-related technologies has evolved pretty considerably. But I just wanted to start with the what it was. Um, before getting into the broader, what it is now and how the regulatory discussion is taking place at the moment. So how would you characterize the idea of cryptocurrency originally? So uh, cryptocurrency originally is a way to transfer value without the intermediary, without any institutional intermediary, but most notably without the intermediary of a government or a government issued currency. So it allows for the direct transfer of value between individuals without intermediaries. And it's a response to the financial crisis of 2008. The, the feeling is that governments are irresponsible about the way that they print and allocate money and that yeah. an alternative mode of value transfer is needed. And so what was the technology that was originally deployed to do that? So what makes this possible is blockchain technology, which is essentially, it's essentially like an accounting ledger on the internet. It's an open accounting ledger on the internet where you can follow the transaction throughout its travels from Mm. one, one person to another one, you know, from the sender to the recipient and that all the, all the participants in the system have an independent interest in the maintenance of the system, and therefore they don't need to trust each other. It is their involvement in the system itself that creates mm-hmm. the reliability. And so it seems that like a core element of that is that those individual participants are both decentralized and somewhat autonomous from any sort of core organizing body or role or person. So how does the technology facilitate that decentralization and autonomy? Well, it's a converse, it's like a conversation between computers around the world. And so it's like the computers are, we are trusting in the technology as opposed to traditionally, for example, when I interact with a bank, a bank is taking my identifying information. I'm relying on the bank's reputation. Mm-hmm. The government is relying on the bank reporting yeah. transactions. We have a kind of social agreement. This turns that social agreement into a wider technological agreement without many of the hallmarks that we consider reliable. When you said you saw that as a response to the financial crisis, was it a response to 
the government policies that led to the crisis and a lack of trust in the government, or the monetary policies that were used in response to the cr financial crisis? Maybe arguably a bit of both, but my understanding is that it's a general, I mean, there's, there's a general sort of like libertarian slash anarchist distaste for government that's at the founding and in, and the moment in which this emerged was a moment where government spending and handling of money was disdained by many. Yeah. And it's amazing how, pers I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about how this technology has evolved, but it's amazing how persistent that rhetoric is. I mean, we have a a leader, we're having a leadership race for our conservative party in Canada at the moment, and the front runner has been saying that cryptocurrencies are an antidote to inflation, right? This is a way of like taking back monetary policy from the state, which is... Which is crazy for a government official to say. I mean... This, at the risk of getting too complex too soon, mm. let's say that it is a very interesting world where the governments, the officials are wrestling with the legitimacy of their own currencies and that to some degree they are undermining, their, <laughs> you know, to some degree they are undermining the legitimacy of their own currencies. It's really so. I mean, not to go too deep on this, but so Pierre Pralyev is the is the he's a longtime parliamentarian. He's been in government for over a dozen years, and he comes out and says this. And then the next day, the governor of the Bank of Canada <laughs> was asked about it and basically gave an answer like you just did. <laughs> like that is crazy. <laughs> like we have a potential prime minister of the country talking about the power of decentralized currencies to take on. The federal government. I mean, it really is something. It's something. And yet, at the same time, if you look at the basis of this whole system, so for example, there are um, a kind of cryptocurrency like stable coins where they're pegged yeah. to the value of a stable asset, let's say the dollar. Yeah. Underneath all of this is a, an existent financial system reliant on governments. And I am not sure. I mean, for all the rhetoric, I am pretty sure the founder of Coinbase and this type of person is not looking to actually, you know, replace the dollar. So this is the, seems to be the attention in the evolution of this space over the past decade or whatever it's been, um, six or seven years, where you have in parallel this sort of ideological or almost revolutionary ideology sitting at the base of the motivation for people, which I think is legitimate amongst a, a group of people. I mean, this is why they are participating in this. But you also have the evolution of a technology in a manner that is built uh, or has arrived at Coinbase, right? Which is back uh, a very mainstream financial institution almost that is backed by the biggest VCs in the world that is trying to normalize this technology into retail investing and into the financial sector. So how, how do these how do these things evolve in a in a parallel fashion? How is that possible? So there are different so for example, let's take Coinbase, which is a good example. Coinbase's goal was always to be mainstream. And in fact, in the yeah. early, early, early days before they got their, you know, their initial funding and all that, I there was a tension between the actual I forget the name of it. It's, it's a British fellow. But anyhow, the original founder of Coinbase, in, in addition, right. he is no longer there. And part of the tension was that he did not want to have some of the, um, like, he didn't want to keep the keys for people because that would mean that then they were yeah. centralizing the information. Then Coinbase, the exchange, was becoming a central intermediary, which undermines the crypto ethos. Now, Brian Armstrong, the founder, who is now you know, fully associated with it. And, and, and yeah. he and he had another founder, Fred Ursum, who joined mm -hmm. after. His goal was to make it mainstream. So he was like, if people, we will hold on to the keys and that way people will be able, they can't lose their crypto. Like we'll be like a regular institution on some level. Now they're publicly traded. They make all kinds of disclosures, whatever. So they operate, their goal was always to be a bridge with mainstream finance and a huge number of cryptocurrency companies now are like that. So you have two strains, like the initial sort of anarchic, rebellious element exists yeah. 
And it exists rhetorically still, even among the very mainstream type. I mean, look at like that Bitcoin conference last, last week and like that rhetoric was front and center still. I mean, yeah, it's the, that's the talk. But the fact of the matter is that these are people who are not only some of them are listed publicly, but they're considering yeah. being listed publicly. They are lobbying the government for laws. They are very, very well aware of the fact that to succeed is to embed yourself within the traditional financial system. And then that will mean more regulation and interaction and less yeah. liberty. And this tension will always be part of the tension. It will be the tension within the fight over regulations throughout. It will never disappear, I think, basically. And it seems like part of the evolution is on that sort of self-governance side. I mean, it feels like the conversation about DAOs and how those are being used to potentially govern various communities or communities of crypto investors or technologies um, is an attempt to say this can exist in a relatively unregulated way, isn't it? Well, look, what they're saying, what the, a true believer will tell you is that this is a new way to organize people and mm. raise capital and start yeah. projects and involve investors. And there are surely some organizations where this is happening, but there are also a lot of problems with it. Like the DAO, for example, decentralized autonomous organization, this right. is like supposed to be run by the community of users who have crypto yeah. tokens. They vote with their tokens. In fact, most people, it turns out, don't vote, even if they have a governance token. Why? Because mm -hmm. they're busy. They're not trying to run a separate online yeah. company. A lot of those, there's a lot of like ideas right. that are very interesting and theoretically may work. But the fact of the matter is that this is an industry and there's billions of dollars in venture capital being poured yeah. in. And so who really has an interest and who's really controlling becomes a question. Yeah. And how those rules, how are the rules of this, of each particular DAO being written and to whose interests and... Underneath all of this discussion of code is there are human beings who write the code, you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. the code is not unto itself. The code mm -hmm. is written by people who can program things to work in their favor or not in their favor, or can make arrangements mm -hmm. in such a way that work for them. And that's a big debate. And even crypto insiders recognize that that's an issue. I want to sort of talk, and why I was excited to talk to you generally is just you've been thinking and writing so much about the regulatory space at the moment. And uh, it's something I've been kind of watching from a distance and kind of really curious about. But it, it seems like the interest of regulators is in some ways a reaction to the increased risks and potential harms that their citizens are experiencing in this space. So how would you define those risks at the moment? I mean, as this technology moves into a much more mainstream retail investing space, there's ads on the Super Bowl, people are spending savings on currencies. Um, what's the level of risk and what are those risks in that market right now? So because the market is very varied, it depends. There's a wide range of risks. Like if mm. you are in deep in crypto and you are trading sort of obscure tokens on a decentralized exchange. So there are some risks, for example, there's a, typically there's like a thing called a rug pulls or like people are raising money for a crypto project. They get people excited about the project. They're, you know, they give out tokens, they sell tokens, mm -hmm. they create a whole situation and then they pull out all the funding and they just disappear. Like that's a thing and it happens. And it happens even to people who are very savvy that they get involved yeah. in things. And part of the issue is there's a lot of enthusiasm and there's not a lot of information. And I think that for regulators, like the big thing is not that they are going to say people can't really trade crypto or they can't be involved in crypto, but do these products offer the same investor protections? And investor protection in the U.S. mostly consists of disclosure. Like we let you know what risk you're taking. You assess your level of risk 
and none of the disclosure regime <laughs> exists in like in the far reaches of crypto, right? I mean, right? You can get closer in. Like now, if you're operating on Coinbase, what are the risks? They might have a hack, but they're insured. The risk is volatility. Like I get my salary converted to crypto, say like the mayor of Miami, and yeah. I have to pay rent and I can't afford my rent to fluctuate 20% over the weekend. That's a risk. You know, I think that the regulators are worried about all kinds of risks for the individuals and in activity that puts people at in danger of not having access to their funds. But then in yeah. an even bigger level, there's the mass adoption institutional adoption, all of this means that crypto, the crypto markets become closer and closer to traditional markets. You know, that presents a risk for the wider financial system. So the more popular it is, the more they have to pay attention. Yeah. And do you, I mean, having watched the space for a while, do you, is it right that this is just the hype around this? Is it a totally different level now? I mean, that Super Bowls kind of seemed like a moment but is that representative of anything, of the level of investment? Or is that just VCs getting into this space and there being a ton of money for marketing now and trying to pull more people in? Well, so I do, th I mean, there was a thing that happened. I think it's a combination of the pandemic. Mm. So the pandemic gave us this meme stock phenomenon. There's a lot of excitement, mm. a lot of people jumping into, you know, a lot of retail investors jumping into markets. And then there's a frothy market. Then there's enthusiasm. Enthusiasm sort of detached from traditional ideas of value. And mm. then that's the perfect jumping off point for a crypto boom. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm not saying it against it because it's a very postmodern question what value is. But, yeah. but, you know, suddenly there's this thing like anything could be valuable. I don't want to miss mm. out. And, and the market really exploded. It exploded, yeah. you know, and a result of that retail explosion is a VC explosion. And now it's just money everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so let's, let's switch a bit to the regulatory conversation, and I want to do a little bit of a tour of what different jurisdictions are doing, but I thought we could start with the U.S., and you've been sort of writing about um, what the Biden administration has announced, that uh, the process they've announced that they are going to begin to embark on. I don't know if that's... <laughs> If that is regulation, but it is a process where regulation will be discussed and developed. Let right? me say, in fairness to government, because I yeah. do think that people are always like, well, what are they going to do? They're going to study more. They studied last year and now they're going to study more. Now, is that nothing? It's not nothing. It's a humongous, like it's a wider range of offerings, of services with different... Um, concerns and different agencies that might have to oversee. So it is the process of studying while the government might never catch up and the industry keeps developing things in the interim. We shouldn't be too disdainful of their desire to continually study without necessarily making... Look, that is such an important point. Like I t teach and work at a public policy school and I should be the first to be careful of dismissing governments taking their time and developing policy carefully, particularly in a very complicated market space. And it means different things. So for the CBDC, the central bank digital currency debate is a perfect mm. example of this. So American innovators, when they want to put pressure on the US government, they're like, we're behind China. Look at China. China is developing. China is yeah. doing this. China is doing that. Rightly, the Fed has said, rightly in my view, has said, we don't want to be first. We want to get it right. Why? I mean, the US has a different um, relationship with its currency vis-a-vis -vis the world than China yeah. does. And so I know we like action, but mm. I, I am pretty comfortable with the idea of studying as a form of action, because if you don't know what to do, it's not necessarily the right thing to do just anything, just to be yeah. reacting. And intent to regulate can actually have an effect on the market. I mean, it will. It could signal a direction which could change the character of what is built. So it does, right? And so even in, in terms of like um, rhetoric and discussion with the government, you can't have, it changes the level of, it puts you in a frame where now we're like, okay, so now we're talking about how we're going to regulate, not if we're going to regulate. And what is 
going to foster innovation and what's not. And process is, legally speaking, process is action and process is our protection. You know, process yeah. is the thing that makes, you know, sort of creates justice or <laughs> right you know i mean again another philosophical statement there you keep falling back into <laughs> oh i'm so sorry yeah you guys will never call me again it's <laughs> no it's great it's great um so if you were to sort of map out or speculate on what the levers are that the u.s government has here so when they're studying the mechanisms they could use um how would you bucket those like what are the things the state could do to uh, to regulate cryptocurrency at the moment in the U.S. So there are depend you know depending what you're talking about in the most general terms you could have different kinds of registrations you could have exchanges that have to register you could have issuers of tokens mm. who have to register I mean technically they're supposed to be. Um, it's not like they are outside the regulatory framework right now. It's that they operate in these kind of gray spaces and enforcement is not clear. And mm. so one of the ways that, like, let's say a bank gets its sort of privileged role in society yeah. is by it plays a quasi-governmental role. For example, it will report mm. transactions to the government and that's enables us to trust the bank in society, right? Crypto companies will start to have to do more of that. Not all the companies, but some companies, depending on what mm. they're aspiring to do and depending on what they offer and who they transact with, will have to do that. There yeah. are other things. You could have special banking charters, depending if, if it's like a, for stable coins. There are all different kinds of um, levers, as you said, that could be yeah. pulled. And I think the question right now is which ones and how much and the industry would like for its suggestions <laughs> to be adopted um, and now will be like a sort of push pull over what what works what do they want so for it depends who like i i will say that because i talk to you know i talk to like a lot of big companies so for me yeah. the, the ceos i talk to nobody is ever like we don't want regulation everybody says we embrace regulation but Let's say different stablecoin companies will will have different views. So some might want a federal banking charter. Some might say the state um, there's like a state money issue money issuer license or something like that that's sufficient. Um, so they'll say they're already regulated because they're registered in certain ways. You know, there's no uniformity. There's just a bunch of ideas yeah. and. Maybe it's not right to say there's no uniformity. There are certain principles that people are agreeing on. So, for example, with stable coins, people will agree that reserves have to be disclosed and they'll have to be shown in a certain way and they'll have to be held in a certain way. Can you just explain what a stable coin is, just to be clear? A stable coin is a crypto token pegged mm -hmm. to the value of a stable asset like the dollar. And they're necessary for a lot of the transactions because... The price of cryptocurrencies can fluctuate in the space of the transaction. So you sort of lock in your value you by transferring things into a dollar-backed stablecoin. And then you're exchanging these things that are attached to the value of a dollar. It's very, it's super abstract, right? So these stablecoins are backed by their value, their reliability comes from the fact that the issuer, a private issuer, not a government, a private yeah. company is holding all these reserves that are supposed to be liquid reserves so that if everybody wants to come and transfer their stablecoin right now for a dollar, they are able to give back a dollar for every single stablecoin issue. Let's say it's a mm. dollar stablecoin. The fact of the matter is that the reserves up until now have been, you know, when people have done investigations of them, they have not always proven to be properly backed and all of that. Mm. So when we're talking about regulation, some of the stuff we're talking about is like just ensuring standards. But because there are so many different kinds of products, what that means is a different thing for yeah it's such a hard and i'm so sorry it's a very no, hard you. conversation yeah. to have because there's so many different things going on <laughs> and yeah. there's one you know we put it under one umbrella but it's yeah. in fact a lot of stuff if a 
government issues its own coin backed by its own currency, is that a crypto? Like, what is that? That would be a central bank digital currency. So okay. if, uh, if a government itself decides to issue its own crypto, it's, a, it, it's the same thing. It's just a digital version of their money. And the U.S., so part when we talk about the U.S. studying, like the U.S. is taking study of that idea yeah. further now than it did last year. This year, it's because of the executive order is yeah. like study with an eye to actually how do we do it? If we were to do it, what would be the design? What elements of safety? All kinds of things like that. And what's the reason for doing that, I guess? Is it just the instrumental benefits of having a digital currency? Or is it something bigger? Is it? You know what I'm getting at? One of the arguments for the adoption of crypto, but it's not like we're not uh, realistically at this stage. And so there's no way to test it. And even if you mm. ask us, you know, like a big stable coin issuer, they'll tell you they're not at scale. Like we're okay. years away from this. But theoretically, if you were doing a whole bunch of transactions on a scaled up crypto market, that things would be smoother and Freer. They would be less expensive. They wouldn't require as many fees. The transmissions would be immediate as opposed to taking days to transmit money yeah. overseas, things like that. So it's for the modernization of the payment system. And that is the appeal. Like when governments do speak positively about crypto, they talk about it as a way to modernize payments and remittances. But that's always the... <laughs> I mean, the remittance argument carries a lot of weight in the, the rhetorical value being pro proposed here. Like, is it? Yeah. So it is. Remittances are huge. Like there are entire yeah. economies that rely on remittances from their immigrant diasporas, right? Sure, but there's other ways to solve that problem. Sure. And that crypto. is exactly what crypto <laughs> critics will tell you. And like a lot of people will tell you, well, the technology is not that great. And even mm. though it's no fees and instantaneous, in fact, go, you know, go try to do a transaction right now. You will pay a lot in gas fees depending on what it is. You know what I mean? Like it's mm. a lot of the, it's. So and it's not as secure or anonymous as we thought it was and so on and so forth. Yeah. You know, there's an idea of crypto, and then there is what is happening, and then there's yeah. what could be, you know? Mm. But yes, payments and remittances is a huge argument mm. all the time. People who are deep in payments, some people who are deep in payments are like, this mm. is not even necessary. Yeah. And some people will tell you, we don't necessarily need a digital dollar because... Um, Money is digitized. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it already is. Yeah. I mean, banks don't physically transfer money between each other. It's all done through a ledger, right, of some sort. I mean, they just, they trade numbers on a ledger, don't they? When they when you do a transfer to another bank in another country. But the, I think that the question now is, so even then, like, even if you're just saying, I'm just transferring on a ledger, like, yeah. I am a bank, I'm closed on holidays, Right. I don't open Saturday and Sunday. I'm open from 10 to 3. Meanwhile, mm. there's a global market going on 24 hours a day, seven mm. days a week, nonstop yeah. transactions with anyone yeah. anywhere. If yeah. that is evolution, then that's then, better. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so just sticking with one more question on the state issuing of digital currencies, what, how has it played out in the countries who have done it or experimented with this? Like the bah in the Bahamas and the Chinese government's been experimenting with this. And the Bahamas I has a sand dollar. And I think they have a quite uh, extensive like regulatory framework set up. And it, you know, it works to do certain things. So like, for example, um, the global crypto exchange, FTX, which is founded by an American who went to... Hong Kong, I believe, to okay. start and has now moved to the Bahamas. Last year moved to the Bahamas because, <clears> you know, there started to be crackdown um, and there's like a lot of noise out of China, whatever. So he went to somewhere where there's a regulatory framework that's friendly to crypto. So some countries are taking crypto very seriously because it can attract investment, 
you know, the Bahamian currency, it's not a global currency. You know what I mean? What, what it's not, it's a smaller question. It's an internal question for that country. I think with the, you know, when, when the U S does something with the dollar, it's going to mean something for transactions around the world. For my whole lifetime, big transactions have been pegged to the dollar around the world. So yes, there are places that are had China has like a digital yuan experiment that's quite advanced. Um, they have two big programs. His names evade me right now, but anyhow, so they already have a very active digital payment sphere going on. That the, yeah. it looks like the government is sort of trying to divert users toward its own system, possibly for data collection reasons and all kinds of, you know, the, like lack of privacy reasons. <laughs> Which is a whole other set of regulatory questions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all interrelated. Yeah, it's yeah. all very hard. It's hard to have like a stance, like what's good or where do people stand or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's There are so many nuances to each uh, question. I mean, another sort of nuance seems to be that the way the EU is coming at this, which part of their approach seems to be looking at anonymity or de-anonymizing de financial transactions that are crypto-based. How, how is that playing out and what, what do they hope to accomplish there? Until like the last couple of years, it was very easy. And even now, a lot of government officials will be like, oh, crypto for illicit finance. Mm. So to sort of decouple the idea of this innovation from criminality you would inject like traditional safety measures. And we okay. consider identity, we societally, we consider identity <laughs> to be a kind of insurance, right? Like it's mm. like, okay, it's you, how you know who to hold liable, you're, you know where to turn and all of that. Now, like the blockchain is supposed to eliminate the need for that because you can follow the transaction. But if you can if you can follow transactions and you can't associate them with individuals from an enforcement perspective, that's problematic. So in the U.S., there's also discussion and there's discussion about more information about transactions being sent to governments elsewhere, too. So for mm. tax purposes around the world, governments want to share information about crypto transactions. And if that were to happen it would be very easy to eventually trace all kinds of money that is now mysterious, <laughs> you know, is in mysterious sure. hands. You know, like this is, again, this is like, there are already companies that report plenty of things. It depends how entrenched they are. And the question of whether or not crypto is really like more convenient for illicit finance, it's not clear, you know, cash is. Pretty good. It's worked for a while. Yeah, yeah. you know, cash is okay. Yeah. Um, and so then there are people who are like, well, at least on this system, you can follow it. Like you maybe don't have a access immediately, but years down the line, you could still trace. Well, we've seen this with a lot of these like FBI investigations into Bitcoin thefts and black market use, right? Yeah. Like in the last year, especially. And so I think that it's um, like, it's just not, I don't know. I can't tell you. I cannot, I can't, I don't have a handle. Like, I don't have any yeah. answers. All I have are questions. Me too. Trust me. <laughs> I mean, that, this, this, you're, you're mentioning of like trying to push to almost smoke out the illicit activity via regulation, I think is a really important observation here. Because I've always believed there was this tension between, the inevitability of this stuff being normalized in our financial system and the potential for it, an element of it to remain illicit and or revolutionary and or a threat to state power and institutional power. And that's a way these things could in theory coexist, right? You get most of it normalized, but you still keep that piece that, that may, like, might be difficult to control just like cash is difficult. So actually, ultimately, I think that that's the direction, right? No mm. matter what, no matter how much regulation, no matter how much mainstream adoption, there will always be an element that, not even just for illicit finance, you know, but an element willing to take on risk in a different way, an element that sure. wants to operate in gray spaces. And there might be a separate crypto sphere <laughs> that's all, you know, that's much yeah. more like the original, but that's not mm. the direction we're heading in. Like, 
And with the amount of like institutional money in crypto, regulation is definitely the direction in my view. Yeah, which is it makes the rhetoric of some of the people who are normalizing and investing in the technology that much more striking. I mean, if you see the the Peter Thiels of the world on stage at these conferences claiming this is going to overturn state power when they need it to be normalized via state power to to see their investment flourish. I mean, it's remarkable. You know, I it's very it's like it's just confusing. Like it's just not logical. <laughs> And I'm not, this is not to, this is not like a diss on the crypto community, but a lot of this, a lot of this has happened because people believed and they believed enough that more people believed and I will surely get in a lot of trouble for saying this, but faith is a huge element of this market and faith is working sure. right now. Faith is making billions of dollars for people. You know what I mean? In order for Bitcoin to rise from nothing to heights of 67,000, there's a lot of belief. And belief is not about logic. It's not purely about logic. They don't need to give purely logical answers. In fact, part of the promotion is emotional on purpose, I think. And look, as you said earlier, I mean... Faith and value are difficult things to to map out. I mean, if people believe something is a value, then markets can be built around that, and they are all the time. You know, this is the question: like, what is real? Well, at this point, it's real. You know, when people will, and people still ask things like, "Well, is this real?" I mean, it's as it's as real as people anything. People are making else. and losing their savings and their their fortunes, and so that is a real thing. So, look, I mean. Maybe we should end on that existential <laughs> observation then. So um, thank you so much for talking this through with us. It was a fun and uh, very informative conversation. Thank you. It was really fun for me too. And I appreciate you not demanding that I have answers. <laughs> that was my conversation with Efrat Livni. As always, you can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation in association with Antica Productions. The show is produced by Trevor Hunsberger, Debbie Pacheco, and Mitchell Stewart, with associate producer Avi Raheja. Please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursdays every week.